All right, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. I'm going to be talking about uh, plant virus disease, maize leaf necrosis, and its emergence globally. And you'll also learn a little bit about mixed infections of viruses because this disease is caused by a mixed infection. The first thing I'd like to impress on you is that viruses are everywhere. We're all painfully aware now that humans have viruses, um, but also we know animals have viruses, insects are among the animals that have viruses, plants also have viruses, and fungi have viruses, bacteria have viruses, and archaea have viruses. And this impacts not only human health, but also plant health, including the plants that we produce for consumption and for other purposes. And all of these different organisms in, in the biota interact to affect plant health. The American Phytopathological Society has um, encapsulated this concept with their definition of the phytobiome, which they say consists of plants, their environment, and associated communities of organisms. So I'm showing you an image here that shows um, plants and all this associated biotic and abiotic factors that impinge upon their health. And viruses impinge upon all of these different factors, all of the different biotic factors in the system, and are important to consider in, in all of the ways that they impact us as well. To next. Um, so some of the learning objectives that I have for this talk are to help you become aware of plant infecting viruses if you weren't already, to identify ways that plant viruses can be introduced to new locations, and describe some of the different ways that plant virus diseases are managed, and possible outcomes of plant virus mixed infections. I don't know the original origin of this uh, quote, but on CDC, you can see this quote now, that a disease threat anywhere is a disease threat everywhere. So when something shows up in one place, we're such a global um, community now with people and plants and transit to different locations so frequent that the rate at which diseases and the pathogens that cause them can move has really accelerated in our current times. This review from 2004 um, talks about different ways that plant viruses can emerge, uh, plant diseases and other uh, caused by viruses and, and other pathogens. So you can see on the left hand is that viruses account for a lot of emerging diseases um, in this study. Of course, fungi and bacteria, phytoplasmas, nematodes, and unknown um, etiological agents can also be responsible for plant diseases. And some of the big factors contributing to their emergence are introduction, as you can see on the pie chart on the right, um, changes in vector population, which are pretty frequent now. We're seeing vectors or changes in the genetics of vectors that are in different locations now. Um, of course, re recombination and evolution of, of pathogens, and also weather and farming systems can impact um, the emergence of diseases or cause the emergence of diseases. Often we don't know exactly what has resulted in the emergence of a disease, um, but all of these factors are really important to consider. So I'm going to introduce a concept that is really basic to plant pathologists, which is the plant disease pyramid, which I'm expanding out here to call the, um, the plant disease triangle, which I'm expanding to a pyramid here with the addition of a, a fourth component. So plant pathologists have known for a long time that a pathogen, in the cases that I'm talking about, viruses um, interact with their plant hosts and with the environment. So that when all of the factors converge in a manner that is conducive for disease, is when we see the disease. And most plant viruses are transmitted by arthropod vectors. So plants don't sneeze on each other and shake hands, um, but they have mobile arthropods often that are moving them from plant to plant and producing their spread. And these arthropod vectors also have interactions with plant hosts that they feed on, environmental factors that influence their distribution and their populations and so forth. So usually to manage plant viruses, we try to disrupt some part of the pyramid. 
here, even a pyramid view is a little bit simplified because actually all of the different biota are interacting with abiotic factors and probably with viruses in a system. And so it could even be more complex than this. But for simplicity, we'll look at the pyramid here. So how do we prevent and manage um, pathogen invasion and disease? Well, for viruses, we're usually looking to disrupt some um, component or interaction of this disease pyramid. So for viruses, for example, on the top, we might be working on detection and diagnosis so that we can prevent movement of pathogens to new locations and make sure that plants that we're putting in the field are clean. So clean plant programs exist for a lot of um, high investment plants like vines and trees, for example, and destroy reservoirs of the virus so there's not a high amount of inoculum. Um, for the vector, you might have management strategies like planting time so that you plant to avoid the highest populations of an important vector of a pathogen. Um, insecticide treatments are sometimes effective and sometimes not. Preventing movement of the insects or the arthropods are also important. And in some cases, we have um, ways to detect and predict populations. And then, of course, the environment is important. We, we can't always change what's going on on the outside, but crop management is manageable. We can um, implement crop rotations to reduce reservoirs for vectors and viruses, um, manage weeds and other reservoirs for either and um, good cultivation practices and even location can all be important for um, disrupting conditions conducive for disease. Often with plant viruses, the most effective way to manage disease is to have resistant plants to begin with. So plants are selected for genetic resistance and resistant varieties are planted where possible. Um, sometimes um, natural genetic resistance is not found and resistance can be engineered, um, like with papaya ring spot virus, for example. Um, and crop rotation can also be really important with the practices in terms of having a plant resident or growing plants susceptible to the diseases that are pre present or prevalent. And what I'd like to point out there is that most of these strategies rely on um, prevention. Once you have infection, there's not a lot you can do. So here are a few viruses of maize. Um, you might be wondering if you haven't really looked for plant infecting viruses before or um, hadn't really thought about them before, what a diseased plant looks like when it's infected by a virus. Well, there are far more examples than I could possibly show you, but here are a few examples from uh, some of my favorite viruses that I've worked on over the past several years all infecting maize or corn, as we call it in the United States. Um, so on the left, on the far right, you can see maize chlorotic model virus, which creates um, a symptom that plant virologists call a mosaic. So there's the light and dark blotching or window painting in, in these leaves. And that virus has an icosahedral virion, you can see on the bottom. Um, the virus next to it on the right is maize dwarf mosaic virus, also causes mosaic, but has a completely different um, virus expression strategy and, and virus particle. Maze necrotic streak virus, this MNESV, has a very bright streaking mosaic. Um, that's a virus that would be hard to miss. And my maze fine streak again has um, a very strong mosaic. MRDV maze rough dwarf virus has um, some interesting symptoms for a virus. These plants have shortened internodes, so they're squat, they're shorter, the, the distance between the leaf nodes is reduced, and the leaves actually become a darker green, so instead of showing more yellowing like the other ones that you see on this page, they're actually a darker green, and I don't have an image of it here, but this virus also causes tiny little plant tumors on the veins underneath, the little nods, little nodules, or enations as they're called. And MCDV on the, the left is a maize chlorotic dwarf virus, which true to its name causes dwarfing and is found just in the veins. And so these veins are yellow where the virus is. So these are just a few of the symptoms that um, might be caused by a virus. And if you start looking for plant viruses, they're everywhere. So now I'm going to move into 
um, describing to you the emergence of maize lethal necrosis, or MLM. There was a major disease outbreak um, first described in Kenya in fall 2011 and spring 2012. And it was such a problem that it started showing up in, in the popular news, which is kind of unusual for a, a plant virus. Um, but this disease showed mosaic symptoms, but also necrosis or tissue death and plant death. And it was associated with maize thrips. And this is really important in East Africa, um, where maize is grown as a human consumption staple crop, unlike in the United States, where we use it mostly for animal feed and industrial purposes. So here on the, the bottom right, you can see Ugali, which is from the white corn, which is where uh, a large portion of the calories in East Africa come from. And maize is grown there with multiple crops, um, multiple maize crops in a year and different stages might be in the field at the same time. So on the left, again, you can see a plant that is infected and has maize lethal necrosis symptoms where you can see the, the necrosis on the margins of the leaf and also um, mosaic in the plant. So what was in the sick plants in Kenya? Well, maize potiviruses were in there. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what maize potiviruses are. These are viruses that have a polyprotein expression strategy. So they produce one large polyprotein that is proteolytically cleaved into a number of different um, mature virus proteins. It's a single-stranded positive sense RNA, as many plant viruses are, with uh, flexuous rod virions. Um, viruses, potiviruses are, are viruses that are classified in the family potiviridae of plant viruses. And they're really ubiquitous, just about every crop has one or more potiviruses that infect it. Um, and the maize infecting potiviruses are in two different genera, the, the genus potivirus and the genus tritomovirus. The ones in the genus potivirus are um, aphid transmitted and wheat streak mosaic virus, which is the one in the genus tritomovirus, is transmitted by wheat curl mites. They all cause mosaic symptoms and have these flexuous rod virions. And we weren't really surprised to see those in East Africa because potiviruses have global distribution and have for as long as we have looked for viruses in corn. So um, here I'm just showing you some of the different potivirus um, species that are in corn throughout the globe. And what you can see is MDMV or maize dwarf mosaic virus and an SCMV sugarcane mosaic virus on the top of this chart have worldwide distribution. They were known to be endemic in Africa already. And there are a few others that um, have been reported in different parts of the globe. And wheat streak mosaic virus, which true to its name is most impactful actually in wheat as its host, um, but also infects susceptible corn, um, is found in some places in the globe as well. So we weren't surprised to find this in East Africa, sugarcane mosaic virus is um, very prevalent. But what was also in these samples is this other virus, maize chlorotic model virus, MCMV. And this virus has a completely different expression strategy. It's also a positive sense RNA virus. It has icosahedral virions, um, and it's unrelated to the potiviruses that I just described. And this had been described in the United States. Um, it, it's readily mechanically transmissible, so humans can move it in the lab if we're trying. And um, in the continental United States, its vector was described as um, trisomylid beetles. Um, but it was also described in Hawaii where researchers found that maize thrips were transmitting it. And what's significant about these two different viruses is that we've known for a long time that when you add, have a mixed infection of maize chlorotic model virus and any of a number of these maize infecting potiviruses, you get maize lethal necrosis. Um, and this is a synergistic reaction. So I'll take a moment to give you a definition of synergism, which is that uh, it's a much more exacerbated disease than either single infection. In a quantitative terminology, that would be a more than additive disease output. But since there's not consensus on what is being added, I'll focus on the, the qualitative definition here. 
so this was disease was originally described called corn lethal necrosis in the U.S. by Chuck Niblett and colleagues in 1978. What you can see in this image from that publication, on the left-hand side, you see a single infection with MCMV, followed by a single infection with uh, the potivirus MDMV and the tritomovirus wheat streak mosaic virus, any one of which causes disease. But you can see it's much more uh, severe when you have the combination. So on the left are two pots with MCMV and MDMV in one, and on um, the far sorry the far right is MCMV plus wheat streak mosaic, and these plants are dead. <laughs> these plants are dead. Um, so that's what I mean by synergism, and you can see this plant from East Africa as well, where you can see the mosaic and the the, the death, the necrosis that's characteristic of maize lethal necrosis. And MCMV is interesting because it has emerged over time and quite rapidly in the last 10 years. So a virus meeting the description of MCMV was originally described in Peru. If you look on the timeline on the bottom here, and then in Kansas and Nebraska, where Chuck Nibble described corn lethal necrosis for the first time. And at later points, it was um, then described in Argentina and Thailand followed by Mexico and Hawaii, where researchers found that thrips could transmit MCMV. And then, uh, shortly after 2010, there was an explosion of MLN um, showing up about simultaneously in China and Kenya and other East African countries, and then in Ecuador and Spain, um, and still being reported in more places. So what led to the emergence of MLN? Well, the short answer, like most disease emergences, is unfortunately that we don't exactly know. We do have some clues in retrospect. So some of the important factors are introduction of MCMV. Um, for example, in East Africa, researchers had described corn infecting viruses and had not found MCMV in previous decades. So it was almost certainly introduced to these locations. Ecuador, as you, if it was in Peru as early as it was reported, seems unlikely that introduction um, was new in the last decade. Um, whether it, the vector was also introduced or, or an efficient vector is really unknown. We just don't know a whole lot about the, the maize thrips and its distribution before and after emergence. Um, cultivation intensity is also a factor. Um, this is anecdotally believed in Ecuador to be important in, in the emergence there. Um, corn production was, was really intensified um, just prior to MLN emergency, or sorry, emergence. And um, finally, the genotypes of corn planted in these locations were susceptible to both of the viruses, both the potiviruses and MCMV. Uh, unfortunately, um, developing good resistance to MCMV is still a work in progress by a number of different groups. I just want to show you a few pictures they took in Tanzania. So here's a, an MLN hotspot in Arusha where you can see a lot of yellowing and death of these mature plants in the field. And um, you can see mosaic and also the necrosis and all those little black spots on the right are aphids. So there are plenty of vectors for uh, the potiviruses for sure. And here you can see tassels that are weighed down with these aphids. So plenty of um, vector load and plenty of virus load in this field. And then on the over, other side of these bushes or, or trees here on, on the right, there are young plants, a new crop, a, a later planting showing up. So these are perfect new places for these insects to go and transmit more viruses and, and deliver more. And I found thrips in these little yellowing plants that you can see and um, virus symptoms starting to show up already. Um, this is from a survey in Rwanda and I just want to show you how high the load of virus sequences are. This is from deep sequencing study. And um, in some of these plants, the sequences re uh, matching virus were even higher than the sequences matching the plant that was hosting them. So MCMV highlighted in red, you can see really high um, read counts mapping to MCMV compared to maize, and these are selected from polyadenylated RNAs. 
looking at the sequences from various surveys I don't have time to tell you all about from Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania, um, I and others found there's a lot of variation in the SCMV coat protein um, at the end terminus in particular, and this alignment just shows you that briefly. And I in my lab also found that another virus also contributes to MLN, um, not surprisingly, this Johnson grass mosaic virus that we found in a number of locations in these different countries. Um, when we did mixed infections, also caused synergy, just like we saw with MDMV and wheat streak mosaic and sugarcane mosaic. So you can see the single infected plants in this picture and then the double infected plants that are looking very dead um, by comparison. So absolutely synergistic MLN here. And why do those things matter? Well, the SCMV coat protein is most often used as the diagnostic to determine virus presence in East Africa. And the SCMVs are very variable. There's a lot of diversity in um, SCMVs in East Africa. And probably this, the isolate specific antisera are not picking up all of them. They don't pick up JGMV. And so there's, we, I recommend using broad spectrum diagnostics for poliviruses to test these plants, which is important for limiting um, movement to the virus and detecting what disease is there. Um, so what good does all this information do? Well, um, I recommend the broad spectrum diagnostics, as I mentioned, um, because of the complex poliovirus populations that are there. We don't have time to show you all the trees and, and different sequences I and others have done, um, but those are needed for the poliviruses. MCMV is actually not very diverse, um, which is good news for detection. Um, international movement containment is also needed, and one of the works in progress is diagnostics for that and assessment of seed transmission, having good um, regulation there. And as I mentioned earlier, efforts to identify virus resistance in maize are ongoing in a number of different groups. Plant resistance is really often the most economical and the most practical way to manage disease um, versus expensive spray. Um, strategies and good information are needed to break disease propagation and um, training people so they can recognize when they have the disease so they know what to treat for. And in the U.S., we've had crop moratoria be really effective in continental U.S. Um, that's a little harder in places that don't have winter, um, but crop and staple diversification and, and rotation might also be very helpful. Now, vector management is desirable, but um, cost-effective methods to do this don't really exist. So there's a lot more work needed still to manage this disease, even though it's been emerging now for a decade. I want to talk a little bit at the end here about um, a maize infecting polarovirus that we also found in studies as another example of um, an outcome of mixed infection. So this virus was found by my group and others in samples across East Africa and then also in South America and Asia. So it seems to be really prevalent globally. And um, when we first found it, it looked most like this maize yellow dwarf virus that had been described. Um, some years previously, but it was different enough that we knew this was a different virus. And field incidences that um, were reported in China and that we observed in Tanzania were very high. Th this virus was turning up in a large proportion of our samples. And I'm just showing you some of the different places that we detected it, just um, from, from a few samples. So we um, isolated this and uh, were the first to isolate and infect maize alone with this virus and uh, remove it from other infected um, viruses that were in samples because this virus was often found in mixed infections with the viruses that we know cause MLN in the field and identify um, species of vectors and start to assess disease. The name for this virus that's taken hold in the literature is, is um, maize yellow mosaic virus that you can see from our findings we, it doesn't cause um, yellowing, it doesn't cause mosaic at all. It causes this kind of um, marginal reddening, which is more typical of, of what we'd expect from a polarovirus. We don't know of any polaroviruses that cause mosaic. And that's published work. Um, but one of the questions we had, um, you know, we know that 
MCMV plus a polyvirus results in this disease, MLN, with defining features including mosaic stunting and necrosis, death. Um, but because people weren't always detecting a, a second virus with MCMV, which may have to do with diagnostics, there's been a wonder um, among people looking at this disease if MCMV plus any stressor or any other virus might result in mesolethal necrosis. And since this polaro virus is quite prevalent and often occurs in mixed infections, we were wondering if maize chlorotic model virus plus this virus might result in mesolethal necrosis. So we went about to test this and have all these different um, single infections, the treatments one, two, and three, uh, mock, which has all the inoculation treatments and was the best control that we had, and then the double infections and the triple infection that were possible. And we measured a bunch of different parameters because we weren't quite sure what things might be affected by um, these pairings, these, these mixed infections. Um, and we were looking for synergy. I told you earlier there are multiple definitions in the literature, which is true. Um, so some of the definitions include um, more than additive effects, um, but again, what is added is not clear. Different methods and different researchers use different parameters, and not all of them are quantitative. Um, increased multiplication of one or more viruses is another definition of synergy. So in the case of MLN, um, the titer of MCMV goes way up. It's already a high titer virus, but it increases drastically. And the potivirus present um, may increase, decrease, or stay the same. Um, but you definitely have an increase in titer of one of the viruses in the case of MLN. Um, and another definition is exacerbation of disease that may or may not be accompanied by increased titer. Um, so it, there's not a perfect universal definition in the literature, unfortunately. So this is another reason we were looking at multiple parameters. here and what you can see is uh, the single infection plants um, going from the left uh, into double infections on the right and treatment seven is the triple infection and treatment eight is what we expect to be maize lethal necrosis and just from this image at 22 days post inoculation you can see they look pretty similar um, but the treatments five and six look a, maybe a little bit worse than the single infections but not as bad as as the treatments we expect to result in maize lethal necrosis. So we did scoring of, of reddening as one of the parameters that we looked at because we knew that the polaro virus caused reddening. And what you can see is that sure enough, there's um, reddening where the polaro virus is present. And here I'm showing you a, a numerical version of this. So the treatments shown in red um, have reddening and the ones that um, don't have the polio virus, didn't have reddening. So reddening was only significantly different from the mock when the polio virus was present. So we were pretty confident that that particular symptom was caused by that virus. Um, then we looked at mosaic, and as I told you, MCMV and the potivirus SCMV both cause mosaic. And sure enough, what we saw is that when we had the polio virus on its own, we never saw mosaic. It looked just like the, the green bars, which are mock and healthy, and the red bar for um, the polaro virus is always the same at the different time points. And this is just showing that in a numerical format um, where, again, the polaro virus looks the same as the healthy and mock, um, but there's a lot of mosaic when the, both of the viruses that result in MLN are present together and it's significantly increased compared to the single infections of those mosaic causing viruses. So again, this maize yellow mosaic virus doesn't cause mosaic in our hands and uh, mosaic is slightly enhanced in the triple infection. And then we looked at this um, definitive characteristic of necrosis, which is again, defining for maize lethal necrosis. And we only saw it when MCMV was present with SCMV. So other pairwise combinations of the polaro virus plus the potivirus or the polaro virus plus MCMV never resulted in necrosis. 
Um, and then we looked at different measures of stunting. So the longest leaf length was one of those. And I will skip to the longest leaf length um, chart here. And what you can see here is that um, the stunting was most severe again in the MLN treatments. Um, but there was certainly significant stunting whenever the Polaro virus was present. So this virus on its own and in combination with other viruses absolutely caused stunting. And another measure of stunting was to look at the height of the highest collar or node. And with that, we had really similar results. So I'll skip over to the um, chart here. And what you can see is, again, the greatest stunting was observed in the treatments where we expected an MLN, MCMV plus SCMV, and then that treatment with also polarovirus added in. And there was also um, stunting in the double infections. It was significantly different from single infections when the polarovirus was in combination of the others. So it did seem to exacerbate stunting of um, either of the other viruses in a, a, a double infection. Uh, but not as much as when you had MLN. So finally, I looked at uh, virus titer. And this was very interesting in this mixed infection. Um, so I told you that when in MLN, the titer of MCMV is increased. So what you can see in this are, are the titer changes for the Polaro virus in red, the um, MCMV in purple, and SCMV in green. And what I'd like to point out to you, so if you look at the purple MCMV in the middle, when it's all by itself in that second row, um, the titer is, that's the single infection titer. And when you add the Polaro virus, the titer is actually um, but not significantly different. But when you add sugarcane mosaic virus in MLM treatment, it's much higher. So that's what we expect to see for that mixed infection that's synergistic. Interestingly, in the triple infection, it was back down to where the single infection level was, even Perhaps the titer increase isn't essential for the synergistic disease. Um, and then the results for uh, the Polaro virus in red was really uh, the titer was comparable when it was in a single infection, in a double infection with SCMV, or in the triple infection. But it was reduced in the presence of MCMV. And for SCMV, it had its highest titer on its own with slightly reduced titers in double and triple infections. So this led me to um, a model. Yes, so polarovirus reduced titers of each of the other viruses in the mixed infection. Um, SCMV enhanced the titers of any virus that it was with. And MCMV slightly reduced the, other, the titers of other viruses in paired infections. So the mixed outcome, uh, the mixed infection outcome is a little bit complicated here. So the Polaro virus seems to inhibit the titer increase the SCMV causes. You can see SCMV on the top with these green arrows showing that it really enhances SCMV, but also enhances the Polaro virus. So, so SCMV seems to be a, a good deal for any other virus that it's with. It seems to be increasing the titer of those viruses. Um, MCMV has a more or less neutral effect on um, SCMV, it does reduce its titer somewhat. Um, so, sorry, MCMV reduces the titer of both SCMV and MAYMV, not quite as much. And um, MAYMV also reduces the titer. So, the mixed infection of um, MCMV seems to be antagonistic towards either of the other viruses. Polarovirus also seems to be antagonistic, where SCMV seems to help both. So the question is, does MCMV plus a polarovirus result in MLN? My answer is no. MLN is not recapitulated in mixed infections that lack either um, necrosis being a key symptom indicator of MLN. But there are some inter interesting interactions that are taking place. So the polarovirus does cause disease on its own and does contribute to disease, including the reddening and very significant stunting 
um, which is not unexpected for a virus in this group. And it does interact with other viruses in mixed infections, even though it's not synergistic with that um, sort of mild negative effect <laughs> it seems to have. And um, the stunting that this pathogen induces um, suggests that it might actually be very important. The polarovirus often flies under the radar because that little reddening and, and stunting that it causes could easily be mistaken for nutrient deficiency or poor growing conditions. And it doesn't have the, the I'm a virus waving red flag like some of the strong mosaics and other more obvious symptoms. Um, and we don't even always see the red flag of the reddening of it because sometimes plants are infected and don't show that symptom. Um, so that those data are published at this um, DOI that I have listed here, but it shows us that there are some very interesting um, possible mixed infections and different routes to disease from plant viruses. The learning objectives that I placed out at the beginning um, so I, I told you that I wanted you to become aware of plant infecting viruses and some of the different symptoms and um, problems that they can cause. So hopefully you've collected that as you've, you've listened to this talk. Um, that you can identify some of the different ways that plant viruses can be introduced and, and understand the importance of sanitation and, and movement restrictions for introduction and management of disease. Um, and describe some of the ways that plant viruses are managed. Um, there are very few treatments for post-infection, so plant virus um, diseases really rely on a heavy amount of prevention or incompatible reactions in, in terms of resistance. And finally, I hope I've shown outcomes of plant virus mixed infections, including um, synergistic disease and more neutral or even antagonistic interactions. With that, I would like to acknowledge some of the different people in my lab who've helped with this work and collaborators on the right-hand side. Um, a lot of the MLN work that I was became part of um, started with Dr. Peg Redenbaugh, and I have a number of different researchers on the side here, George Mahuku, Chuck Niblett, Andrew Kagundu, Godfrey Asaya, and Wengai, and and Theo Assimui, and folks in my lab who've done a lot of this work with me. Um, Kristen Willie, Jane Todd, Cizo Malachwa, Nitika Katri, Saranga helping out with the bioinformatics, um, Jovia, and Deo Masawi. With that, thank you.